Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this lecture is uh, not unrehearsed. I've given it several times, and uh, the audiences I address have to be used to my using the slides I bring as uh, prompts to what I'm going to say. First, I want to thank Dr. Algio for his kind introduction, especially its reasonable brevity. <laughs> He's been very gracious in persuading me to come and give this talk, and I hope I justify his confidence by interesting you in what has interested me. The first slide, which is on the board, uh, describes, or rather lists, six uh, sources of evidence for life after death. The visions of dying persons, the experiences of persons who come close to death and survive, apparitions, possession, mediumship, and children who claim to remember a previous life. Uh, if those of you who are here now come on Saturday, I will say something about the first five of these. But this evening I'm going to talk exclusively about the sixth item, the children who claim to remember a past life. One of my habits is that of reading widely in all sorts of books and magazines. And many years ago, I began noticing reports about children and adults who seem to remember previous lives. And I clipped these out and filed them. They were in um, sources that we would probably consider dubious, magazines and newspapers. At least most of us as scientists would consider them doubtful. One or two were in uh, more um, prestigious journals. One, a French journal that had been turned, the article had been turned down by an American a journal of the type, but the French published it. And uh, over the years, I don't know how many years, it might be 10 or 15, I collected 44 cases of people who had claimed to remember a past life. These could be thinned out and I uh, put aside about 15 of them or more, maybe nearly 20, uh, on the grounds of um, inauthenticity, as it seemed to me. But that left uh, 25. And among these 25, uh, the age was given in the age of the person was given in nearly every case. And I was impressed by the frequency with which the subject making this claim had been a very young child. Here I'm going to read the actual figures. In 22 of 25 cases, the subject was under 10 years old and in eight of the 25, the child was under three years of age. There was also noted quite commonly a tendency for the memories of the subjects to fade with time as the child reached middle childhood or a little later, say the ages of seven to 10. It struck me then that if uh, there was anything t worth pursuing in these experiences, they should be sought among children. So I wrote a paper about these 44 cases, 
as I said, thinned out to 25 that seemed deserving of attention. And uh, Dr. Elgio mentioned that paper uh, because it, uh, um, I rashly entered it for this competition in honor of uh, William James and uh, it was awarded the prize. And uh, this is the first page of that paper. This was published in the Journal of the American Society for Psychical Research in April and July of 1960. So that takes us back a good time. <coughs> it didn't attract much notice. As I recall, there was nothing associated with the prize except the honor of having something given one that was named after such a great psychologist as William James had been. The paper, nevertheless, was read by two people who turned out to be important in the further development of these studies. One was Eileen Garrett. She was a well-known medium, and for those of you not familiar with that term, that refers to a person who uh, believes that he or she can receive communications from deceased persons. She was a well-known medium, but she was also a notable entrepreneur, and she founded the Parapsychology Foundation, which still exists. She had been sent a report of a case of a child who said she remembered a previous life. And she telephoned me, I was then at the University of Virginia, and said, uh, we have a report of a case that seems like the ones you've been writing about. Would you be interested in going to India and taking a look at it? So I said, yes, I would. But in those days, I was so busy with my clinical and uh, administrative responsibilities that I couldn't go during ordinary time, so I went during my vacation in the summer. I had just enough money from Eileen Garrett's foundation to pay for the first trip of six weeks. And the other person who read that paper came into the picture at that time. This is Chester Carlson, the inventor of xerography, who had become wealthy and largely through his wife, Doris, had become interested in paranormal phenomena and had been already supporting some persons investigating these phenomena. And someone mentioned my name to him and he, he approached me and offered me some money. I said I couldn't take any money at that point because I was too busy with my responsibilities. Nevertheless, I did accept a little money for a tape recorder. And so I went to India and began to search for the children that I had read about. Now I want to show you some illustrations of some of these children and briefly describe them. This goes back to 1961. Some of the children as we'll see were no longer in the very young age. This is Swarn Lada. She's on the right. Her father is uh, the uh, white-haired man in the middle. The other man is her uncle. Swarn Lada at this point is about 13. She had remembered the previous life of a woman who had died in the 1930s. And um, she also had memories of a second life that she claimed to have lived uh, in what is now Bangladesh. 
she was able to perform dances and songs in Bengali. That was certified to me by a Bengali associate. Swarnata still had memories at this stage, and she has kept in touch with me, sends me a Christmas card almost every year, and is now a teacher in a college in India. Another subject of the 1960s was this boy. Now this is not a, a child's photograph, obviously. Uh, this is Ravi Shankar. He's a young adult here. He had a, a birthmark of increased pigmentation. I hope you can see that running along there. An area of darkness right there. When he was born, that birthmark was down here around the neck. And someone said it looked as if his head had been glued on. And the glue had run over the seams. Ravi Shankar, as a young child, talked about another young child who had been brutally beheaded his case also was fully verified, despite the objection of his parents. This was my first introduction to birthmarks in these cases. This subject is Nanatilika. Now we're in Ceylon, now called Sri Lanka. And Nanatilika remembered the previous life of a boy who himself had talked about rebirth and uh, came very close to saying that if he were to be reborn, he'd like to be a girl. Nanatilika was quite boyish. So here I encountered the first case of the sex change type of which I was later to see many more examples. And now, still in Sri Lanka, or Ceylon as it then was, we have the case of Wujaratna. Notice his shrunken right arm compared with his left. And uh, you see the muscle of the uh, right chest, the major muscle, is missing. He has a rare syndrome, first described by a, a British physician called Poland. That's uh, as in the country, but he wasn't Polish, he was British. Poland syndrome is a very rare malformation occurring in uh, fewer than 1 in 20,000 births. Wujaratna, as a young boy, around the ages of two and three, talked to himself, and his mother overheard him. He was saying, I was born with this bad arm because I killed my wife. She knew nothing about any killing, but she mentioned the matter to her husband, who said, uh, when he heard more details, he's talking about my brother. And what Wijaratna was saying was true of his father's brother, who was Ratran Hami, who had indeed killed his wife. More properly uh, speaking, uh, he'd killed his fiancée, but in Sri Lanka, engagements are much more serious affairs than they are in most Western countries. If you're engaged, you're really fully committed in the uh, tradition of the Sinhalese Buddhists. Uh, you can't change your mind and say, I'm going off with someone else. But this young woman did that, and Ratran Hami became enraged, went back to his village, paid off his debts, sharpened his knife, and w went back to her village and killed her. 
Uh, this was in the days of the British, and they duly arrested him, and after a trial he was hanged. He said he dropped into a pit of fire after that. He continued to have memories and continued to think that he'd done the right thing up to the age of at least 14, when, which was when I first met him. Later, he changed his mind, perhaps under the influence of his parents, and decided that it was wrong to kill fractious women who broke their word. And he permitted me to enter his change of attitude in the second edition of my book, my first book. So that summarizes what I was beginning to learn in that first trip to India. There were many surprises for me in that trip. One was the abundance of the cases. Before I went there, I had this one case that had been reported to Mrs. Garrett, and I'd heard of a few other cases, three or four perhaps, but I had no idea that uh, they were easily ascertained. And yet within the four weeks I spent in India, I learned about 25 cases. <clears throat> the same thing was true in Salon. I knew of two cases, Wijaratnas and Nanotilicus. They had already been studied to some extent, especially by the monks. And yet, uh, within a few weeks, I had learned of another three cases uh, within just one week in, in Salon. I also became uh, aware of the complexity of the cases. My first idea was that uh, these cases just consist of a child saying, I am so and so, I used to live in such and such, I want to go back and be with my real family, and that was it. But that wasn't it. In fact, there were what I came to call behavioral memories, fears, aversions, special and unusual likings, unusual play in which the child seemed to be reenacting the vocation or the avocation of the past life remembered. This child, Parmo Sharma, claimed to remember the previous life of a shopkeeper who had also a machine for making soda water. In those days in India, there was no such thing as bottled water, let alone bottled soda water, or, and um, you, you could um, not obtain Coca-Cola, for example. It shows you how backward they were, if you use that, you want to think about that. At Parmode, as a child, played at shopkeeping, and he would uh, offer water for tea and little mud patties for, for cookies and uh, vend these to playmates and anyone else who would buy. And he spent so much time at this play that his mother said that accounted for his backwardness at school. And in fact, he fell behind uh, scholastically. And when I last uh, had any communication about him, he was not doing well uh, because of this lack of education. His mother may have been right that uh, he had frittered away his early childhood time in reenacting in play the occupation of the shopkeeper whose uh, life he seemed to remember. His case, incidentally, was well verified also. A uh, correspondent who I had thought was unfriendly to the idea of 
paranormal phenomena occurring spontaneously, nevertheless wrote me about a case of which she had learned in Alaska. And I corresponded with the person she mentioned in Alaska and went out to Alaska uh, later in the same year, 1961, and began then to look at cases among the, the tribes, the ethnic groups, now they're now called First Nations. This man had a prominent birthmark here, an area of increased pigmentation. As a child, he remembered having been killed by a thrust of a spear. He himself was born about 1895, and the person whose life he remembered was an uncle who may have been killed in one of the last spear fights among the Clinkins. Another case in Alaska was this child who's had a tiny birthmark the birthmark moved with the child's growth uh, so that from being up near the eye, it had moved down to the tip of the nose about here. It's, I'm sorry, not more visible there. He had a second birthmark on the back this area of hyperpigmentation there. You can't see it, I'm afraid, in that slide, but there are little punctate marks on either side of the main birthmark. And I think, I say think because I'm not sure, but that this birthmark corresponds to a biopsy that the previous personality had had uh, with a view to ascertaining whether he had tuberculosis or perhaps a cancer of the lung. At any rate, that was my introduction to cases among the uh, Clinkett of Alaska. You can imagine that by this time I had uh, developed some at least crude ideas of how to investigate these cases. Now, interviews are obviously the principal instrument of investigation, but the interviews must be with persons who know what they're talking about, who are first-hand witnesses of what they say. And it's not easy always to distinguish them. Sometimes persons talk on and on and on until I have a chance to say, were you there? And I'd, I would say, no, I was in London uh, when we're talking about events in India. So they, of course, have to be set aside. I take notes. We don't use tape recorders except to check on the notes. We did that sometimes to uh, check on the accuracy of the notes. And sometimes I was able to have two interpreters and we would ch uh, check them against each other or and, and both against notes that I had made in English. And then of course we would seek out any printed or written documents. They're not easy to come by in Asia. Uh, one is lucky to find a horoscope with an accurate date. But then the horoscope, when was it made? Well, it was made uh, uh, maybe last year, and the child is now five. But I had a piece of paper on which I wrote down the date. Oh, could we see the piece of paper? No, we don't have it anymore, but we were sure about the date. But I wasn't sure, of course. 
Nevertheless, we pursued written records when we could. And as I'll explain later, if the death was violent and there was a post-mortem, we would search out for hospital records and post-mortem documents. In recent years, we have, more accurately, my colleagues have given psychological tests and special questionnaires to the subjects. My colleague, uh, Dr. Erlander Haraldsson of the University of Iceland has been uh, particularly uh, progressive in that respect. He's given psychological tests to children in uh, Sri Lanka and uh, also in Lebanon. And um, I should mention also Dr. Antonia Mills, who has uh, done uh, psychological testing of uh, persons who as children spoke about previous lives and who are now adults. This shows you that uh, I had extended the survey that I was making uh, to a considerable extent into other countries. And I was continuing to go to India. This is a fairly typical village scene of an interview. This is our office. The witness is here. In a situation like this, we would ask everyone present to be quiet while we listen to the witness and we would have a witness box and ask uh, the, the person we wanted to interview particularly to sit or stand here. And then uh, if anyone else wished to sit, contribute and seemed qualified to do so, we would ask them to sit or stand in the improvised witness box. This is Dr. Satwan Pazricha, whom I recruited in 1973. She's now a, uh, she was then a graduate student. She's now a uh, full professor at the National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences in Bangalore. This is a medical student who opted to make a tour with us. He didn't uh, pursue the investigations further but continued on in conventional psychiatry. That introduces, or rather re resumes, a study of uh, birthmarks. I'm sorry that you can't see Hanuman very much. This is a 14-year-old boy. His father here, uh, Dr. Marotra, my interpreter here. Now, Hanuman had this birthmark, it's an area of decreased pigmentation right here. And one of the first postmortem reports I had showed how the person whose life he remembered had been killed by a shotgun. I was lucky enough to have the assistance of the uh, district pathologist. I made a sketch of the uh, human trunk and I asked the pathologist to circle on the sketch the wounds described in the postmodern report. This is his signature here. And you can see the close correspondence between the wounds and uh, Hanneman's birthmarks. This, um, the victim in this case must have been shot at close range and was probably, as happens in gangster activities, uh, probably murdered uh, unintentionally when someone else was intended to be killed. Uh, but he was dead anyway, and Hanneman spoke about the life of, of this person and uh, his statements were quite adequately verified. I put these in just to show the 
diversification of my endeavors. This is a child of of Brazil, who remembered the previous life of his own older sister who had committed suicide. Not a very strong case, because it's what we call the same family case. This is that subject in, uh, when he was older. Now this is a family of Lebanon. When I was in Brazil, uh, studying the cases I've just mentioned, I had a Lebanese uh, interpreter who could speak English as well as Portuguese and he s became interested in what I was doing and he said there are lots of cases in my village or at least in my area uh, and he scribbled in Arabic some words and a name and he said go to this village and they'll help you there. So in 1964, I went out to his village. It's uh, about 40 kilometers east of Beirut, a place called Cornell. I was uh, in a taxi and I, we stopped in the village. A small crowd gathered, wondering what stranger was doing there. I showed this card, it was in Arabic, for all I knew it might have said, slit this man's throat and take his money. <laughs> but uh, they murmured among themselves, and there was a little eddy at the back of the crowd, and then a five-year-old child was pushed forward, and they, they said, this boy speaks about a previous life. This little five-year-old, I think he's just under six, maybe five here. So I had a poor interpreter, at least I thought the taxi driver wasn't qualified, so I went back and engaged a better interpreter. I came back the next day and made a full record of what Demar had been saying. And then I went to the village that he claimed to have lived in. It was a place called Hribe, uh quite far uh, as distances go in Lebanon. It could be described as very far from Cornell. The family had not verified what Imad had said. So here I was in possession um, of a chance to study a case that has not been verified and has not been uh, checked out at all uh, before a written record of what the child was saying has been made. These are precious cases because they refute the criticism that can be made and is made about cases that are recorded only after the families have made and the child's statements have been verified. Imad's statements were fully verified, not without some difficulty, because what he said about uh, Hribe, the other village, might have um, uh, applied to several members of the same family. Now, this is a case in Turkey. Uh, I want to bring this out because uh, It shows a feature that I consider particularly important. This is not a subject. This man is a bandit, a very well-known bandit, Jemal Hayek, who uh, killed a couple of people who had, he said, raped his sisters. And um, he was arrested, then he escaped uh, the French controlled that part of Turkey and he and his brother hid out in the woods and practiced banditry for a couple of years. 
eventually they were betrayed. The police surrounded his, the hut where he and his brother were uh, refugees. And uh, gradually they engaged in a conventional shootout and the police got near enough to pour gasoline on the house and set it on fire. Jemal Hayek knew that he was going to be captured or killed, or captured and killed most likely, and so he decided to shoot himself. He first shot his brother and then he shot himself. And see the birthmark there, it's a hairless area. Now you say, how do you know that he shot himself? And that was first of all his statement, which uh, didn't account for very much. But it happens that I was able to meet Jemal Hayek's uh, sister, and also, with great good fortune, I met one of the French gendarmes who had been in the police shootout, and he in fact claimed that he personally had kicked open the door of the house and discovered the bodies. And both these people gestured uh, as they described the wounds, they mentioned this one, and then they raised their hands like this to show that the bullet had lifted the top of the head of the skull quite off. So I thought, if that's true, then he ought to have another birthmark. So I went back to Jemal Faraji. He had never mentioned a second birthmark. He'd only mentioned the one under his chin. And I said, did you have a second birthmark? And he said, yes, and there it is. So I got an artist to sketch the presumed trajectory Now just to show that I'm trying to keep up with other branches of science, I'll mention that I'm now engaged in trying to arrange for Jemal Faraji to have an examination with what we call magnetic resonance imaging, which would show whether or not there's a trajectory of abnormal tissue along this line. The problem here is to find uh, qualified radiologists in Turkey, but we're uh, still engaged in that search. I want to take you briefly to Burma and mention that conditions of travel there are uneven. This is This is crossing a river. It's uh, thought to be used to unusual company. It's a, a jeep, the principal mode of transport. In, uh, uh, and this is an interview in uh, Burma. Notice the crowd around, all very peaceful. And this photograph was taken by my interpreter. The subject is this young lady. She remembers a previous life of a Japanese soldier killed in the fighting in 1945. When the Japanese War Graves Commission came out to Myanmar and the, it'd be probably in the 19, early 1960s, she told them where the fighting had been, where she'd been killed uh, near a monastery about uh, one and a half or two kilometers from her village. And she told them where to dig. They were searching for evidence of Japanese soldiers. So they followed her instructions and dug and they found uh, remnants of, uh, including insignia of Japanese soldiers where she had told them they would find such evidence.
this is another subject in in Burma now, Myanmar. This is uh, the subject. This is his wife. One of my assistants rebuked me for always keeping my head down, making notes. Said I missed seeing the emotions, and I think. Uh, it was true to some extent. This is the birthmark on that subject. He was, the person whose life he remembered was shot probably by communist insurgents. Now we're in Thailand. The birthmark is here. I'm sorry it's a little faint, but it's small and round. And he has here another birthmark about the left eye. Notice that's long, larger, and irregular in shape. That accords with what forensic pathologists know about bullet wounds of entry and exit. The bullet wound of entry is nearly always small and round, and the bullet wound of uh, exit is larger and irregular in shape. And the birthmarks so far as we are able to trace them, correspond uh, with those features in uh, something like 10 out of 14 cases we have. Now, birth defects, these are, of course, much rarer than birth marks. Here is a potter chopping machine very commonly used all over northern India. It requires two men to operate it, one to turn this big wheel, and one to force the stalks being chopped up for fodder uh, into the path of the blades. In the case I'm describing now, a, f a father was operating the machine singly, by himself, without a second man helping him. And he what did not notice then that his child approached and put his hands into the machine here and had his fingers chopped off. He died of some unrelated illness, not from losing his fingers, but from some unrelated illness about a year later. Then several years later, a child of another village was born with this serious birth defect. Now, notice that the thumb is affected here, as well as the fingers. But the family of the boy who, whose fingers were chopped were certain that the thumb had not been affected in that boy, not been cut off. So I, I play around with the idea of course, familiar to physicists and to some extent to biologists of a field effect. Though in this case, the field effect, if there was one, has gone awry a bit so that the thumb has been affected as well as the, the fingers corresponding to those that were cut off by the fodder chopping machine. Other birth defects such as this one occur. This boy <coughs> remembered the previous life of a man who had fallen asleep. He was a village farmer. He'd fallen asleep after a long day's work and a neighbor had come along and in the twilight, so he said, this took him for a rabbit and shot him at point blank range. He was taken to a hospital and died about six days later. Um, next slide shows the child's normal left ear. And I'd like you to look especially at the face and you'll see that 
one side of the face is poorly developed. Hemifacial mycosomia, we call that in medicine. He was very troubled by his appearance, thought it might be repellent to girls, was embarrassed, and he was full of thoughts of vengeance against the neighbor who had killed the person whose life he remembered, said he was going to kill him. The neighbor had ple pleaded, as I mentioned, that it was accidental. The judge was skeptical and sent the assailant to prison for several years. Then he came home, the assailant, and set himself up as a small uh, vendor of rake, which is the local distilled beverage. It's uh, their equivalent of gin. And it's sold in bottles, uh, moved around on a cart. And Semi, who was still loaded with thoughts of vengeance, would throw stones at him and try to break his bottles. My interpreter pleaded with Semi to be more forgiving. He said, uh, suppose, suppose he had killed you. Here you are, you're, you're alive now. What's the point of killing him? And Semi would say, I know you're right, but I just have this sense of hatred that wells up in me and I can't stop it. And this went on for some years. Eventually, uh, Semi reached the age of military service in Turkey at 18, and he went into service. And um, a plastic surgeon in the army fashioned for him a better shaped ear. And at the same time, the fashion for men's hair changed in Turkey and uh, became okay to have long hair for a man. So when we met Semi, he was then, he was 21 or 22 when we met him again, and now he was relenting and said he was willing to let the past go. Uh, so that, that was a, a lesson in the power of the behavior of these children and the uh, possibility of, of reform in this life, if not in, in between. I have a note on my notes. It says, stop here. <laughs> and I would like to stop here, but I want to, uh, I'm not going to, I want to show you two or three slides that bring out uh, the behavior, the unusual behavior of the children. It's so, it seems to me, uh, even more important perhaps than uh, birthmarks and birth defects. And I'll just quickly show you a few examples. Well, this is another birth defect, child who remembered being run over by a train. This is a case of cleft palate. This is a, the child, remember the previous life, of a man who had terrible disfigurement of his nose and uh, lips from leprosy, a disease still found in parts of Asia and then in that time in Burma. Here's the boy after a hair lip repair. You can just see the scar there. But he's still got a cleft palate. Uh, at least you should be able to see the hole here. In this case, we were able to be of some help because we were able to assist in arranging for him to have that cleft palate closed. The, the beautiful emotion in this case 
I think I call it beautiful because the parents of this child were the only people who had stayed with the man having the leprosy. The other villagers, including his wife, who took the children with her, had fled from him because of the, the, their own fear of leprosy. But these people, who were more distantly related, stayed with him and they would bring food and water to his little hut where he lived. And their reward, you might say, was to have this boy as their child. I said I was going to talk about behavior. This is Jazz Beer, who died and then came to as a different person, said he was a high caste Brahmin, not a, a low caste Jat, refused to eat his family food. And they had a, a Brahmin woman uh, nearby who cooked for him. That went on for several years and they finally persuaded him to eat that is, his family persuaded him to eat their food. This little girl went on a hunger strike unless her family took her to the town where she said she'd lived. She said she'd fallen from a big height. There's her birthmark, which was verified to some extent in the hospital report. She had a fractured skull bleeding from the the ear. She had been playing with a, a cousin uh, above a, a stairwell and I think it was accidental. The child uh, thought the friend, actually a cousin, had pushed her. I think that's unlikely. But anyway, she fell and uh, died a few hours later of brain damage. These are twins of England, Jillian and Jennifer. Jennifer had two birthmarks, and Jillian had none. They are, by the way, identical, that is monozygotic. There's Jennifer's had a birthmark here. But this slide, is the most interesting. It shows them as they're learning to write. They remember the previous lives of two older sisters who'd been killed by a um, car driver who ran off the pavement onto the sidewalk while they were walking. And at that time, Jennifer, who um, was remembering the previous life of uh, the, uh, the older sister called Jacqueline, was just learning to write. Her older sister, Joanna, is holding the pen here. Notice that she grips the pen in a conventional way. At least it seemed conventional to most people. But Jennifer here is holding the, uh, the pencil in, uh, with a fist. And these two ways of writing correspond to the ways that the older sisters, who were respectively 11 and 6, had. So this, I claim, is a behavioral memory. Uh, these twins, to repeat, are monozygotic. They're identical twins. One has two birthmarks, the other none. One has this writing feature. These are, does anybody recognize these? These are Chang and Eng, the original Siamese twins. They weren't Siamese, but that doesn't matter. We can let that go. They, they were conjoined. What's interesting to me about them is that Eng, who's on the left, 
uh, was irascible, irritable, and he drank, sometimes excessively. Toward the end of his life, uh, he was at the level of debauchery. Eng, on the other hand, was gentle, quiet, bookish, and virtually a teetotaler. How to account for that? They didn't remember previous lives, but they uh, epitomized the problem that these children pose. So now I really will stop and invite your questions if you have any. Um, like the boy with his hand cut off, then the next life he didn't have a hand. Do you, do you think that uh, maybe he was supposed to live without a hand uh, originally? Are you going to repeat that? Yeah, the, the question is, uh, we see in the case of these birth defects, for example, the, the boy who was, was born with, uh, the, without a hand, uh, do you think that he was intended to live without a hand, therefore? Yes, because in his previous life, because of well, the he died before he could live a life without a hand. Uh, that, 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 that theme kind of played out a few times in the presentation. I think there's... Uh, part of us, I've got a name for it that I won't offer tonight, perhaps, uh, but that th that portion of us carries with it, acts as a vehicle between this life and another, and that it retains prints. Uh, its form is altered by injuries, and these in turn have their effect uh, on the fetus, the embryo of the next life. Here we're touching on the, the major problem of biology. What is form and what is life? And uh, ultimately these cases uh, may throw light on that uh, perhaps greatest of all questions. Dr. Stevenson, have you noticed any consistency between the length of time of the death of the previous personality and the birth of the new one, and the geographical distance between where the death occurred and the new family lived? Is there any, uh, any link between the uh, lapse of time between the death of one personality and the birth of another, and the distance between uh, the locations of the two personalities? That the question is, is there any consistency in the time and the link over the? Is there any consistency in the time between last life and next life and and places? Um, no, I don't think so. But uh, I think part of your question might bear on the interval. The interval is shorter uh, when the death is violent than it is when the death is natural. But the violent death occurs in about 70% of the cases. Uh. Uh, Dr. Stevens, would you say something, perhaps briefly, uh, of what in your own personal experience got you interested uh, in this phenomenon? You obviously began very early in your own life exploring past lives, but you haven't told us anything about what you, what led you in that direction? The question is, uh, what led you into the investigation of these phenomena? Thank you. Uh, John Algio asked that question earlier and I couldn't answer it. I still can't. Sorry. <laughs> Perhaps it was something carried over from a past life. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Young lady, ma'am. Uh, yes, hi. Your um, history would show um, there, there was a lot of distance between the death and the child's number of the brain. What I'm concerned about is from your warm and your family, you know, like in the case of the child that remembered his uncle who had murdered his fiance, is it possible that that? Stuff in the 
I'm having a little trouble hearing you too. Let, let me see if I've got your question. You correct me if not. The question is, in the cases where the past life was in the same family, is there any possibility that family tradition could have carried through and influenced uh, the, the supposed memories of the past life? I suppose the energy, like through the DNA, the memory. Or simply within the, the, the family energies. And yeah, yes, there, there is a possibility. Of course, the um, most important possibility is that the family talked about the deceased person, say a beloved grandmother or great aunt, and that is a weakness. Or even so, uh, we have some cases that are same family cases. The most American cases, I'm talking now about cases in the United States, and we have now a good many, uh, I've had uh, about 120 cases that I've studied, and my um, colleague, Dr. Jim Tucker, has, who's only been at this a few years, he's already studied about 50 American cases. Okay, well, they're all same family cases if they're solved. By that, I mean that they're verified. And um, the child may, may uh, speak about some other subject to some other deceased person, but that it can't be verified. It's very rare to verify an American case that isn't the same family case. And so there you have the weakness that members of the family may have talked about that person. Uh, there's also a, the possibility in some cases of a genetic factor. Um, Dr. Tucker has a case now, which I hope he'll publish soon, of a child with congenital heart disease, a very rare type of congenital heart disease in which the main artery to the lungs from the heart is uh, severely constricted. And this child remembers the life of his maternal grandfather who was uh, killed in a shootout with robbers. And um, Dr. Tucker has a post-mortem report that shows where the fatal wound was, and it, uh, it uh, ran right through this artery in the deceased grandfather. Had the parents talked about that? No, they would say absolutely not. And even if they had, how do we account for the, this extraordinarily rare malformation? Some of us hope for uh, another book on American cases of the reincarnation, Dr. Uh, I think we'll have uh, just, just one or two more questions because the hour is late. Uh, is there yeah, David? Not any pattern uh, to the way you have discovered the American cases? Random or are they? How did you discover the American cases? <coughs> is there any pattern to how you discovered them? Uh, they, they come particularly um, after some friendly journalist writes a, a paper about us. Uh, that brings in a, a shower of cases. There was a writer in the New Yorker who took a fancy to me and he wrote a couple of articles about what I was doing and each time there would be a shower of, of mail. There was a lot of chaff but there was some wheat also. Okay, we'll have just three more questions and I've got them picked out. David? No, no, I'm sorry, the gentleman in the back. Dr. Stevenson, um, having given so much of your professional life to this, what would you say the most significant impact of this has been on you personally? Given the fact that you have devoted so much of your life to this study, what would you say is the impact which the study has had on you personally? Well, I. I hope it's had some. I, I think among other things it's uh, taught me the value of, of individuals, uh, people who've helped me, uh, people like uh, Chester Carlson. What on earth impelled him to, to pick me out when he had so many other worthy sources of his largesse? Uh, he was such a splendid person. Uh, 
just to know him has enriched my life. So uh, that's what I've got. I got the, the joy of, of friendship and splendid colleagues. Given the, uh, the, the progress that's been made in DNA analysis, do you foresee any attempt to look at DNA as a way of explaining or verifying these things that are passed from an uncle to a, you know, to a nephew? It, it may be so. Uh, the, the, the question has to do with the relevance of DNA. Uh, certainly, uh, the zygosity is important in twin studies. And uh, now we're using uh, buckle swabs. That is, you rub a little cotton swab on the inside of the cheek, and the technicians can get uh, from the cells uh, the DNA to show whether the twins are monozygotic or dizygotic. I had a, just to illustrate the, the uh, use of modern technology, um, Dr. Kyle, one of my associates, studied a case of twins in Myanmar, and uh, the twins had been in a, said they had been in a helicopter crash where they'd killed. They were killed in the crash, and nobody knows the cause of the crash, but one twin was blaming the other for causing the crash. So I managed to mail out to Dr. Kyle in Myanmar some material for buckle swabs. He sent it back to me and I had it analyzed in Virginia, all this by, by airmail, and they turned out to be monozygotic. That still doesn't take us very far, but that's beginning to bring in DNA. One more question of the lady right here in the center. If, um, as Rupert Sheldrake has suggested, if we have a morphic field, and that's what survives between lives, what do you think it is about the experience, either the injury or violent experience, that makes it feed back so much upon the morphic field that it then in the next life can only print, in effect, badly, or in a deformed way. And uh, do you think it can be corrected in any way in this life, once it's happened? Rupert Sheldrick has suggested that we each have a kind of morphic field, uh, and that that yeah. may be what carries over from one life to another. Uh, and if that's the case, uh, do you have any comment about uh, Give me the last the, the, the way that the, the negative feedback from what happens in the field in this life onto the morphic field, how does it how does it work? Do you have any theory about how does it Do you have any theory about how in fact the impact on the morphic field can carry over to the new life and have uh, an effect on the new body? Well, as I said, I think there is some kind of vehicle which I call a psychophore. That's just uh, uh, an English adaptation of a Greek word meaning mind carrying. So there's nothing very new about it. But I think you have to imagine some kind of a vehicle. I uh, have immense respect for Rupert Sheldrake, but I don't think he's come to grips with the uh, individual cases that uh, we have deployed. Okay, well, we thank you all very much for being here. Good job.